Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. My guest this week is Ned Connor. He is a veteran of the U.S. Navy Seabees from World War II, and he's kind enough to join us today to share his experiences. Ned, it's good to have you with us. Pleasure to be here, Greg. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, tell our uh, listeners and viewers a little bit about your, your background. Uh, where did you grow up, and how did you join the service? Well, I uh, grew up in uh, Greensburg, Pennsylvania. It's in western Pennsylvania, about 30 miles uh, east of Pittsburgh. And uh, after high school, I, uh, the war had started. I uh, graduated uh, when I was still 17, and I went to a, uh, an aircraft uh, school in Glendale, California called Curtis Wright Technical Institute. Uh, wanted to get into the uh, ground forces of the uh, Air Force. So it was 1,920 hours in 10 months, and when I came back, I uh, tried to enlist and uh, had a weakness in my uh, uh, left eye vision that uh, they wouldn't accept me, and, uh, but the uh, requirements for being drafted were physically somewhat less. So I, in a month or two, uh, got notice of being drafted and uh, hoped to get into the uh, ground forces of the uh, Air Corps. But at that time, they were looking for uh, the lowest level uh, rating people, uh, youngest, uh, for the uh, Navy Seabees. And uh, when I went to the first desk, I was a sailor, and he put it down that you're in the Navy. And I said, but I was to go to the cellar. You're in the Navy, buddy. Get out of here. So you do what you're told in that period. It was a uh, very popular war. And prior to getting into the service, I had that trip on a train from uh, the Los Angeles area back to the uh, Pittsburgh area. It was a long train ride, and uh, there was no air conditioning on those trains, so the windows were open, and particularly when we got to the Middle West, we uh, had the windows open, and uh, uh, every station we would stop at, boy, there were these ladies. Uh, with all types of gifts and things like that, uh, snacks, beverages, and they would go down the line, and everybody on that train, except maybe two or three people, me included, were in uniform. And I can remember how this lady came along and was giving this, and she got to me and withdrew what she had. I felt terrible, but it taught me how huge the participation in World War II was, and I couldn't wait to get into uniform. It was embarrassing not to be. So uh, then uh, after getting in, uh, went to Camp Perry, Virginia for boot camp. We had uh, Marine instructors, DIs, drill instructors. They were very, very <laughs> hard on you. <laughs> and uh, What was that like? Well, I tell you, you'd, uh, they would do anything to make you miserable. Uh, they would come in at uh, 2 in the morning in the barracks and uh, uh, wake you up and get you out and uh, uh, drill. Uh, there were some people that smoked and uh, to teach you a lesson. I remember one guy was uh, smoking a cigarette and when the uh, DI said uh, the smoking lamp is out, he took his cigarette and took one final drag, and the DI said, go over there, get that shovel, dig a hole. He had him dig a hole six feet wide, six feet long, and six feet deep. Took two days. Had him put the cigarette down there at the bottom and fill it back up. So they just did it to teach you, don't question. And you know, at uh, the young ages, of late teens, early 20s for many, you did what you're told, and they made that uh, point so clear that uh, you never questioned. So you all got the message pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. So after boot camp, Camp Perry, Virginia, we uh, took a train uh, thinking we were going first uh, the way the train was headed to Gulfport, Mississippi, and then uh, it turned, then we were going to Great Lakes. Uh, these are places where the Seabees would embark for overseas. Finally ended up at Port Wyneme. California, which is in Ventura County, north of LA. And your final training there occurred. And then you go to San Francisco, and we got on a troop ship. 
and it was a very interesting ship. It was a captured uh, Italian liner that uh, was renamed, or perhaps renamed, it was uh, the Monticello, uh, similar to the uh, Jefferson's home. And it uh, was a real luxury liner, the third largest in the world at that time, converted to a troop ship. So we had 7,000 troops uh, and uh, probably about 1,500 ships company on that ship. Going across the Pacific, because this ship was fairly fast compared to many of the ships that had uh, convoys, escorts, uh, we did not. Uh, and so during the day we would zigzag because of submarine concerns and at night go straight. And then uh, after 29 days and uh, the only stop was in New Caledonia, an island uh, uh, in the South Pacific for some reason and then to uh, Milne Bay, New Guinea on the eastern shore tip of uh, what is Papua, Papua they call it, New Guinea now, which was a very major base, supply base, and we operated uh, uh, the docks, loaded and unloaded ships, uh, did some construction work, had a lot of heavy machinery, but the uh, number of ships that uh, we worked on were uh, over 500 and uh, mostly American but uh, British. Uh, the Scandinavian ships were always the nicest. They had electric winches whereas uh, most of the others, particularly the British, had old steam winches. And uh, you either worked on the docks where you load pallets or in the hold or I was a winch operator much of the time. So we just stayed there, wondered where we were going to go next. And we never did go anywhere until the war was over. And we said, wow, and I meant to bring, but I couldn't find it, a little newspaper from our battalion that was put out on one sheet of paper, eight and a half by uh, my 15 or 18, chaps surrender. We thought, oh, we're going home. Well. We didn't go home for another uh, four or five months because somebody had to take all this material and either get it ready for shipping back to the States, but in the most of it, we took out into the bay, which was huge on, on these pontoon, pontoons, and pushed it off into the water. We're talking about bulldozers. We're talking about uh, steel for Quonset huts. We're talking about you name it. The amount of material that was destroyed is typical of, I guess, in any war. The uh, costs include what you don't think about when it's over, getting rid of the material. Now when I hear about them coming back from Afghanistan and all, I can imagine the logistics problem of what to do with the material. So uh, when we did come back, uh, uh, we came back on a, uh, on a, what was called a, a mini aircraft carrier, about 10 or 11,000 tons, uh, the USS Attu, which is named for an island up there in the Alaska area. And that was very different than the 29-day excursion going over. This was much faster. We stopped at Pearl Harbor, had Liberty. Actually, we stopped at Melbourne, Brisbane, Australia, because we had a boiler problem to fix. So we had some variation. You could go up on the flight deck anytime you wanted. Uh, very different than the trip over. Came back, Treasure Island is where we landed. And it was interesting, at Treasure Island, uh, they operated the mess hall 24 hours a day. They were still bringing troops home then. They were, the war was over for some months, but it's amazing how long it takes to get everybody back. And so when you come in, you go directly to the mess hall. You can order anything you want. We got in at uh, close to 1 a.m. in the morning, and uh, I ordered a big steak, a head of lettuce, and a quart of milk. 
because overseas we never could get fresh anything. And milk I loved, but you couldn't get that sort of food stuff. So after being there for a while, why uh, not too many days, uh, we took a train to Sampson, New York, and I was discharged in uh, March of, uh, I had looked it up this morning, March 13th of uh, 1946. And I then had a high school diploma, uh, some uh, s things dealing with aircraft and engine uh, qualifications that uh, were not useful. And uh, under the GI Bill, I entered the University of Pittsburgh in June of 1946. And I can't be more complimentary of our government uh, for the investment that they made through the GI Bill. Not all, everybody may have taken advantage of it, but the government return was great from those that were educated. So because I was behind in time, I, uh, I went around the uh, clock, the uh, semester I took uh, electrical engineering and I finished in two and two thirds years. Did nothing but go to school and study. Occasionally you'd eat, but other than that, you did nothing. Got out in February of 49, graduated, and uh, immediately had a job. The best one that was offered was uh, from a General Electric Company and started in February uh, at Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And uh, every three months you would go to another plant to learn about their products. Uh, next plant was uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, the gas turbine locomotive. While there, I uh, married my wife now of almost 65 years. Uh, uh, and uh, after a couple of weeks of marriage, uh, only a couple of weeks, we left uh, Erie for Philadelphia where I had an assignment dealing with the switch gear uh, that GE manufactures, and then to Syracuse for airborne electronics, where we uh, were per trying to design and improve the height altitude indicators of radar, and then we would have these large uh, uh, planes take off from uh, Rome Air Force Base in upstate New York, and we would uh, calibrate our our equipment, our height indicators, indicate what we were reading and they would tell us what the altitude really was. So it was involved in that development, which was interesting. Then there's connected in New York, which and was... We'll just take a quick pause there. We'll pick up your story after this short break. This is Veterans Chronicles. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by Ned Connor, a U.S. Navy veteran of World War II, served in the Seabees. He's uh, given us the the general outline of his uh, service to this country during World War II and talked a bit about his post-war life as well, which we'll return to in a moment. But uh, Ned would just like to kind of dive into some of the, the, the details uh, about your service. The Seabees were created after Pearl Harbor. Uh, they were, World War II was their first conflict that, that they were a part of. What was it like to be uh, part of this new unit? I know you said earlier that you wished you were in the ground forces of the Air Corps, but uh, was it exciting to be part of this new venture? Well, it was in a sense, but uh, I had a disappointment in the sense of uh, late in boot camp uh, in 1943, a new uh, activity uh, was uh, started called uh, UDT, Underwater Demolition Teams. Uh, the UDT teams uh, were selected from the Seabees. Uh, possibly, not exclusively, I don't know, but uh, in the group of my boot camp, uh, we were made aware that there were these openings. I applied, was not accepted. I uh, don't really know what the requirements were, but uh, they uh, had the primary task of uh, going in before the Marines would go into an island and uh, take out the underwater obstacles. Uh, using uh, uh, munitions. Well, that endeavor became very 
important and did some wonderful work and became what is now the uh, Navy SEALs. That's where the, uh, the SEALs came from the UDT teams and evolved into that, which I always thought was interesting, but I was, uh, I applied but wasn't accepted. So it makes me think that, you know, in World War II, 16 million people total wore a uniform out of 135 million total population in the United States, over 10 percent, that's a lot. And those that were not, overwhelmingly, women included in particular, worked in some way dealing with the war effort. You know, Rosie the Riveter. Sure. Uh, it was the most popular conflict. I cannot convey the feeling uh, to be a part of what is totally popular and cohesive all together. It's never occurred since then, and I don't think it ever will. And shouldn't if it could stop some of the warring. But hell, that was the last war we were going to have. And look at all that followed. Certainly. Yeah. It's certainly true. So uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it was so warm in New Guinea that uh, we worked uh, four shifts, six hour shifts. So we had four, you would work six hours and then another group six hours. So the, um, we had a base outdoor theater and so no matter when you got off, the mess hall was always available. Uh, there were movie theater when it was dark, we had movies every night. Uh, the only Japanese that uh, I didn't see, but occurred uh, in our immediate mess hall where when the weather was raining heavy, uh, three instances occurred where Japanese soldiers who fled into the uh, jungles and the highlands uh, and uh, were not captured, got so hungry they would come into the chow hall at nighttime with ponchos over their heads. They were so hungry in uh, three instances where they were caught. So um, it made me aware of the variety of things, you know. I see the majority of the 16 million were not in combat. It takes so many people to, um, to operate a war. And uh, I was so disappointed not to be one of those in conflict and now I'm very thankful. CB's obviously it's heavy labor. Uh, you talked a little bit about with working the winches. There's obviously many different construction projects going on. Did you have much background in that? And, and how long did it take you to kind of figure no, it out? No, because uh, being young and uh, low rating, I uh, went in as an apprentice seaman and uh, was discharged. Uh, I had uh, the rating of coxswain, which uh, you can operate uh, the barges and boats. But uh, uh, the labor was uh, what uh, the lowest level of uh, hale and hardy males can do. For example, cement was a big item that you would uh, find uh, that uh, you were taking on uh, off a ship or loading it on, and you'd pick up a cement bag. Well, I want to tell you, the cement bag weighed 40, 94 pounds of cement, two pounds a bag, 96 pounds. You pick it up, it's so hot you're wearing shorts. You cut off your thing, you wear a hat on your head, nothing on your shirt. You pick up the bag and move it. You do that enough times and finally it's bleeding in your mm. midsection with cement powder. So it was physically very hard and it couldn't have been done by other than young, healthy uh, people. Ned, let's pause right there one more time. We'll come back for our final segment with retired uh, Navy CB uh, Ned Connor, uh, served in the U.S. Navy CBs during World War II. We'll be right back. We are back. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, joined today by Ned Connor. He is a CB, a U.S. Navy CB from World War II, and he's been sharing his experiences with us. and. Uh, Ned, you talked about how you went through boot camp. You mentioned that there were still some Japanese in, in the hills there at Milne Bay, even though the, the fighting had uh, long ceased. 
Um, they showed up in your mess hall when they got hungry enough. D did they ever uh, launch violence at you, try to attack in any way? No. There was none of that. There were so few of them. Uh, uh, when they were stomped uh, by the Australians in uh, probably uh, in 1943, latter part, uh, they receded backwards. Uh, that was their furthest penetration that way. Going uh, further west, though, in the Celebes and some of those islands, uh, the uh, Japanese were there much longer. Uh, the only uh, spot in New Guinea uh, further uh, west uh, from Milne Bay, which on the eastern tip, was uh, an air base, Hollandia, and the uh, aircraft uh, were active taking off from Hollandia. But other than that, there was no further military action on the island of New Guinea. Uh, you, you mentioned some of the, the work you did with the winches and you know, loading and unloading and, uh, ships and so forth. Talk about some more of the projects that, that took place. Were there major infrastructure projects going on as well, or was it mainly with the ship? No major infrastructure projects at all. It was strictly, uh, we had uh, docks to maintain, uh, rebuild. We had ships to load and unload. We had uh, materiel of uh, such a variety to store in uh, outdoor areas and keep intact and then reload ships that would take it further to where the uh, campaigns had achieved uh, by this island hopping. So it was strictly a supply support uh, activity. Uh, and it makes me aware of just how much it takes uh, to maintain uh, a military action. Uh, and the poor guys that uh, were up at the front, Lord, they took a terrible toll. How much did you talk to the men coming in and out on these ships about what they had been through? The ships that we saw were all cargo ships and the only uh, military aspect, every cargo ship had a, uh, a crew of uh, Navy people man manning uh, a couple of turrets that would be uh, for protection but uh, not terribly effective, not like a warship. But every, every merchant ship did have uh, a Navy complement to uh, provide some protection beyond just uh, small arms. You talked a little bit earlier about the climate at Milne Bay and in New Guinea. How much interaction did you have with the locals? And what was that like if you did? Well, the only locals were natives. Uh, they were uh, inland a little bit from uh, where our uh, encampment was. Uh, we uh, encountered them. Uh, there was no communication, uh, verbal, that was uh, effective. Didn't know any of them. Uh, very, uh, very primitive people. And later, I, one of my daughters brought home uh, a, a fellow uh, whose name was Ivan. And Ivan was very short and had pygmy-like features. And uh, I said, where are you from? And he said, uh, from uh, Papua. And I said, well, I'm, an, I'm a citizen of Papua. And I said, let me show you. And I went upstairs and pulled out a card. After you were in New Guinea for 12 months, you became a citizen. <laughs> and he was very impressed. and. Uh, or appreciated hearing that. And he came back the next day and knocked on the door. And I answered and he had a tissue paper package in his hand and he held it out. And I took it and I opened it and it was the shirt that he had on the day before when I met him, which was yellowy, it was white once, but uh, dirty. And it had a large circle with four quadrants where you would have a, a mother of pearl shell, you'd have a, 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 a blue empress butterfly, you'd have a 
period of uh, four uh, things about New Guinea. And I learned later, I hardly wanted to touch it, that to give it as a gift with great feeling, you give it right off your back. Had he laundered it, it would not have been, in his culture, anything at all. I still have it. That's a tremendous story. That's a great story. But uh, so you see, we, we supported uh, the activities which were throughout those islands in the Pacific. Uh, so many people involved. But, uh, I came out learning how to, you know, accept what's you got to accept, and uh, it taught taught life's lessons in spades. And believe me, it's had a positive effect on my whole life. Give us a couple of those key lessons. What were they? Well, that's a good question. How do you express these things? Uh, well, there's the, both the acceptance, but as you mature, you will strive for uh, achieving you learn how to balance your life. Uh, you appreciated the uh, gains that come from peace, prosperity, maturing, and the appreciation for your government because of all that they did. The GI Bill, the education that comes from that, it paid your tuition, it paid your books, it gave you $50 a month. Uh, my wife and I went to, uh, bought our first house in Schenectady, New York. We paid $7,290 for a brand new house. Got a 4% GI loan with nothing down. 4% doesn't sound like much in these last few years, but uh, prior to that, nobody saw anything but much higher, somewhere between 7 and 8 percent and 18 percent. Right. So the government was good to you. I feel uh, duty bound to, to live as honorably and support your government. And uh, it's hard to see when things go sour, as they seem to have in the last 10, 20 years. Sir, you were talking earlier about your life following your time in the service, your education, your marriage, your uh, different jobs. How well do you believe that the mili your military experience in the CBs, both the specific skills you learned there as well as some of the, the lessons you were just talking about, help prepare you for your future careers? None of the skills uh, uh, are significant that I learned. Uh, the life lessons are huge in uh, how you look at life and how you attack the opportunities that then come to you through further education and jobs. I, after I was with GE for 10 years, I found the training I got at a great company like that was significant and I was hired by a uh, firm uh, in Attleboro, Massachusetts, Instrument Development Laboratories that was very significant in uh, the areas dealing with electromechanical switching that was used in the uh, space early space work. The Abel Baker Monkey satellites had IDL commutating switches both in the vehicle and down on the ground which sample information transmit down uh, you know, 100 signals a second, different aspects. And so uh, uh, it gave me a chance for an education. The government uh, gave me an opportunity for a good job. I became president of the, that company. And then I uh, came to Washington and became president of uh, Gardner Laboratory, which was a uh, instrumentation company that uh, specialized in uh, optical uh, sciences dealing with equipment that uses the 
primarily the uh, visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum for uh, being able to measure color, uh, gloss, haze, clarity, uh, all things that you would find in the paint industry, the textile industry, the cosmetics industry, the pharmaceutical industry, you name it, there's an appearance factor dealing with every product that is made. So I have uh, evolved and would not have had that opportunity. My plan originally at high school, due to the fact that my father was killed in an automobile accident when I was seven years of age. I was the youngest of six children. My mother had to raise on a very limited budget uh, starting in 1932, and I learned how tough it is. And how, in my case, my mother raised a family when you don't think it would be possible. So it's not the experience in any one segment of your life, be it the military or it's the combination and how it affects your whole uh, view of life. Uh, you want to accomplish, you want to see your children. We have a large family. We're uh, fortunate. I've my wife and I have six children. We have uh, 16 grandchildren. We have eight great-grandchildren. Uh, it's wonderful to see life evolve this way. And uh, most are better off than we, which is good to see. You mentioned, obviously, the difficulty of your family, not only losing your father, but it was a couple of years into the Depression at that point as, as well. How well do you think that mindset helped you help so many in your generation prepare for the challenge that came a decade later in, in World War II? It sure helped me. Uh, my father was uh, very successful by the material standards of that era. He, uh, his grandfather, his father uh, formed a company, a uh, construction company that uh, specialized in tunnel work. And so uh, they did big jobs. They did uh, the Mill Creek sewer in St. Louis. Uh, so uh, I know a couple of my siblings were born in St. Louis. And uh, that's a job that uh, took uh, four or five years. Well, at, uh, in the uh, late 20s, 1930, uh, my father's company got a job down in the Yellow Mountains of Tennessee. Not many people know of the name Yellow Mountains, but at that time they bid the job with the engineering information they had, and it was inadequate in that they ran into flooding, which uh, cost a fortune to take care of. They had a payroll robbery, all cash, $7,000. So uh, at that time in the uh, 1930, 29, 30, 31, that period, that was a huge loss, uninsured. And so actually his company uh, needed, he cashed in most of his life insurance, which he had a lot of. And when he was killed, my mother was left with uh, six children ages seven uh, to 16 and $50,000, period, to raise on her own. So I learned from my mother and the behavior of my siblings uh, how you pull through tough economics circumstances. and. Uh, I guess what I want to say is you can look at any aspect of your life and it's a part of a total. And you are influenced by the combination of everything and the way they go together. And the military side, uh, less than three years, turned out to be 29 or 30 months. And I'm now, I'll be 90 in uh, June. Uh, and yet it's very significant what it did. 
but there are 88 other years. So I guess I just want to say you've got to take everything together and uh, see that it works. And, uh, and I'm very fulfilled. We have a great family. Ned, we thank you for your service to our country. We thank you for your contributions to our society in all those other 88 years that you mentioned. And we thank you very much for coming in today and, and sharing your life story, in addition to just your military story, your entire life story with us. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Thank you. Ned Connor is a veteran of World War II. He served with the Navy Seabees. He has been our guest today on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks for listening. <laughs>